All right, we are going to continue tonight with our look at spiritual gifts. Um, so far, we've been kind of walking through 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, it's probably going to take us a, a good while to get through that chapter. Um, we're not exclusively there, but that's forming uh, most of the discussion that we're taking, that, that we're doing at this point. Uh, for those of you who may not have been with us over the past Several weeks, um, we're kind of using Sam Storms' definition of spiritual gifts, that those are uh, God-given capacities to serve in the body of Christ, and then kind of a tagline to that, they are God going public among his people. Uh, that is very much in keeping with what we read in 1 Corinthians twelve seven. It says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So when, when the Spirit works in and through us, uh, he is manifesting himself. He is going public uh, among his people. There are uh, four different passages there listed on your sheet that you can use uh, to do some further reading about uh, the, the spiritual gifts that we read about in Scripture. There are, uh, there are three books, three or so books that I've been using to kind of guide us through this time. Uh, in our first few weeks, I leaned very heavily on Ken Hemphill's You Are Gifted, kind of in this middle section where we're trying to uh, look a little bit more specifically at some of the individual gifts. Uh, I'm relying a little bit more on Sam Storms' book, uh, The Beginner's Guide to Spiritual Gifts. And then I got another uh, wonderful little book. I should have brought it in here uh, this, this evening, but I uh, just got a copy of one of Henry Blackaby's little small books about the size and shape of the treasure principle that we went through or ref referred to during our stewardship series. Uh, but that book is called What is So Spiritual About the Gifts? Uh, and it's a, just a great little overview of the spiritual gifts. I'm, I'm not anywhere near done with it, uh, but it's already been a blessing to me. So I would recommend any of those resources uh, as we uh, look to learn a little bit more about spiritual gifts. So we're going to start tonight talking about some of the keys to giftedness. Um, and I want to go to that book by Henry, Henry Blackaby. Um, by the way, if you somewhat recognize that name, um, he's the one behind the very popular study, Experiencing God. Uh, so that's how we know his name. Uh, great teacher of the word. So uh, I, I've picked up in the middle of a sentence here. So you'll notice the ellipsis at the beginning, and the one at the end leads us into the next, uh, well, it just shows that he's not done with that quote, but I'll, I'll show you the beginning of the sentence in just a minute. But before showing you the beginning, which demonstrates the condition, I want to preview what he says are some of the promises or some of the outcomes of the condition that I'll show you in just a second. So if someone said to you, that you didn't have to struggle with burnout serving God or carry the weight of anxiety or stress and that your Christian life can produce joy. Is that something that you would be interested in? Is that, are those results that you would like to be able to experience? Those, those are pretty attractive results, right? Well, the beginning of the sentence, uh, the way Henry Blackaby leads into that is, he says, as you understand more about the strategic plan in God's heart for sending the gift of the Holy Spirit, you won't struggle with burnout serving God or carry the weight of anxiety or stress, and your Christian life will produce joy. So as he says there, as you understand more about the strategic plan in God's heart for sending the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that just reminds me that one of the keys to giftedness is new thinking, uh, now, hopefully, this is not uh, entirely new thinking for those of you who were here Sunday night, because we talked about this during our, um, during our grow groups Sunday night. We spent time in Ephesians chapter 4, which, by the way, uh, if, you, if you notice on your outline here, Ephesians chapter 4 is also one of the passages that deals with spiritual gifts. So, really, what we're studying on Sunday nights is kind of an, uh, an outpouring, or a, it's kind of a a further continuation of this, uh, this topic of spiritual gifts and the giftedness of the church and how the Holy Spirit brings unity in the lives of believers as we grow together and are fit together and work together uh, to do the things that God has called us to do. 
And yes, we have more rain. Aren't y'all excited? I'm very excited about that. Can't wait to see, can't wait to see how wet my garage is when I get home. Um, so, but, but it, it, is, it is evident that, that part of the key to living in that giftedness and to living out your giftedness is to have new thinking. Uh, I shared with my table a phrase that I've picked up from my wife that we have to avoid stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. That is when we, when we fall prey to the lies of the world around us and we start thinking like the world instead of thinking like God has caused, uh, called us to think and taught us to think. Um, you know, Paul... Paul talked a lot about that. Uh, he, he talks a lot about our thinking in lots of different passages. Um, so we looked at this Sunday night where he said in Ephesians 4, 17, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So to use Andrea's phrase, the, the Gentiles, those who are not in Christ, that's not a derogatory term. It just means the people who are disconnected from Christ they are guilty of stinking thinking. You know, they, they, are, they are walking in the futility of their minds. The way that they think uh, is not in keeping with what God would have for us. And then if you fast forward two verses, um, he, he goes into a couple of details about that. He, he begins to, um, to draw out some aspects of their stinking thinking, the futility of their minds. He says they have become callous, and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Um, so one of the symptoms of stinking thinking is our greed to practice every kind of impurity. Um, and I, I love what, uh, what I read about that today by James Stewart. Uh, he said, many want the Spirit's power, but not the Spirit's purity. The Holy Spirit does not rent out his attributes. His power is never separated from his glorious self. Uh, you may remember that the episode in the book of Acts, uh, I wish I knew the exact reference, but there's that episode where um, someone approaches the apostles and, and it sees the miraculous work they are doing, and he wants in on that. He, he wants to have the power that he sees um, but without having the relationship. He doesn't, he doesn't want to surrender his life. And, uh, and James Stewart says that to some degree, that's what we're all guilty of, that we want to experience the Spirit's power. You know, when we talk about spiritual gifts, uh, hopefully it's because we want to live in that area of giftedness more. We, we want to see the results of the Holy Spirit living in and through us and, and see his power in our life, but we're not always committed to the purity that is required to walk in that. Um, you know, we, we, there's, there's a lot of talk, and a lot of times during this series, uh, I've kind of shortened his, his name or his title by just saying the Spirit. Um, but what is his full name? He is the Holy Spirit. And so if we're going to walk in the, in, the, in the step of the Spirit, if we're going to walk in step with the Spirit, and if we're going to desire to see more of the fruit of that Spirit in our life, wouldn't it make sense that we would need to be living lives of holiness? Uh, so I would say another key to giftedness is not just new thinking, but holy living. And think, about, uh, think about how disconnected those two can be sometimes if we're not careful. I don't know about y'all, but we had um, my, my table... Sunday night was right over here. Uh, I was at table number six, I believe, right over here in the corner. And we had great discussion uh, about the way God wants us to use our mouth and the way God doesn't want us to use our mouth um, in, in keeping with growing together and, and honoring the body of Christ and avoiding that corrupting talk and you know, uh, taking off falsehood and putting on truth. We had a great discussion, lots of new thinking going on. And then we left the sanctuary and we returned to life. And I'm sure some of us, including myself, stumbled on Sunday night even, and certainly on Monday and Tuesday, because our new thinking 
doesn't always lead to holy living. We have to make that choice. And so part of what we need to be reminded tonight is that we're not looking, we're not looking at, at a new understanding of spiritual gifts such that we can just learn about them and put them to use outside of a relationship with the Holy Spirit and a surrender to the Holy, Holy Spirit, but to recognize that, that we're going to see more of the giftedness and more of the Holy Spirit's power in our life as we surrender ourselves more and more to Him with new thinking and with holy living. Uh, that's, that's why we, we've, we've talked about this in the past, that uh, we, we just had to continue to grow in that surrender. You may remember, you may remember the, first, the first week of our series in spiritual gifts, I listed those starting points for spiritual gifts. Do you remember what they were? Three words that start with S. What are the starting points for spiritual gifts? Salvation is the ultimate starting point because until we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we don't have his giftedness. And then we talked about surrender. And this is what I'm talking about here. We're surrendering our way of thinking and we're surrendering uh, our own choices to live in the holiness that God has called us to. Um, so that, that holiness is very, very important. Uh, Peter talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. And in this verse, you'll actually notice that not only is there a reference to the new thinking, or more specifically, there's a reference to the old stinking thinking, and then the connection to holy living where he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Okay? So that's kind of a warning for us, right? Because even, even when we're in Christ and we have a new way of thinking, we are being renewed in the, uh, we're being transformed in the renewing of our mind, but still... We have that stinking thinking living within us. And, and Paul says, or Peter here says, you've got to be very careful not to obey those passions that are connected to that former ignorance. Uh, but instead, use that new thinking, have a new way of thinking that leads to a holy way of living. So I just kind of wanted to throw that in at the beginning just to remind you um, we're, we're not studying tools in a chest like we would if we were walking through the tool department at Home Depot or Lowe's. You know, just because we're learning more about these tools doesn't mean we're going to walk in them more effectively unless we have the new thinking and the holy living, unless we start with salvation, recognizing that we're bankrupt without Christ, uh, unless we continue to surrender ourselves to him as we read about in Galatians chapter 5, and then unless we have the motivation of service. Uh, that was that third starting point. Because uh, remember, 1 Peter 4.10 says, each one should use whatever gift has, he has received to serve others. So the whole point of spiritual gifts, as we read about in 1 Corinthians 12.7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's not for me, it's not for you, it's for us. We are to use the giftedness to build up the body of Christ. Okay, I want to just remind you the passage we're working on right now. We talked about um, the utterance of wisdom and the utterance of knowledge last week, but let me just reread this paragraph uh, before we move on to the next one. So I'm reading from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses, uh, picking up in verse 4, and I will read through verse 11. Uh, Paul says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each, and he's talking about to each Christian, to each person who has trusted in the Lord Jesus and then has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, this is the verse we looked at last week, for to one is given the Spirit uh, for one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Uh, so this is the verse we'll be working through tonight. And then for future weeks, uh, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, uh, to another... By the way, let me just uh, add a little story here in case I forget. So when we get to prophecy... Y'all rem remind me to tell you a story. I think I, think I was the recipient of a, um, 
of a spontaneous, unsolicited gift of prophecy yesterday morning at my accountability breakfast. So just remind me about that when we get there. Um, blew me away how clear it was to me that God was using one of my pastor friends to speak into my life. Now, he wasn't predicting the future, and he wasn't telling me what stock was going to be, uh, but he was, he was clarifying something in my life in a way that he had no idea about. He said it, and my eyes got like this big, and he was like, what, what is wrong with you? And I said, I'm pretty sure you just shared a word of prophecy with me. He had no idea, and so I shared it with him. It was really cool. So let me, remind me to tell you that story when we get to prophecy. Uh, so to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to, to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Uh, so going back to verse 7, just to get us in context, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To each is given. Uh, I like what David Pryor says about this in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. He says the tense of the verb is given in verse 7 indicates firmly that such endowment is not necessarily or even normally a once-for-all gift, but a constantly new provision of whatever may be needed in the variety of circumstances faced by the Christian community. So I think Pryor makes a very good point and a good reminder for us that in some circumstances, I don't know if it would be all circumstances or not, we, we may have spiritual gifts that God gives us that, that are kind of more resident in our life. Um, I would hope that I have the gift of teaching in a way that's more resident in my life. Uh, and, and you probably have some giftedness that would relate to that, uh, where you recognize something on a more ongoing fashion. But I think in many cases, much like the story that I'll tell you that I just introduced, uh, I, think, I think a lot of times it is just the Holy Spirit uh, giving us a gracious gift in the moment that we need it from whoever is there to share it with us. Um, I think that's a lot of how the Holy Spirit works, and that's why we need to always be in, in, uh, in communion with the Holy Spirit. That's why we need, need always to be surrendering our life to the work of the Spirit in our life because we want to be available to whatever God wants to do through us uh, in the presence of the lives that are around us. Um, so it, it is this new provision, uh, which means that you might see evidence of a gift in your life at a certain time and then not see evidence of that. For, for a while or even ever again. Yet God might use it uniquely. Um, and then, he, then, then we get to verse 9, which is what we're talking about this morning, uh, where he says, He has given to some, to another, faith by the same Spirit, um, to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. So we're going to be talking tonight about faith. I doubt we will get to healing. Uh, we might just barely touch on it at the end. But, but, but as we begin to talk about faith... Uh, Sam Storms um, gives a great summary of what he, he calls the three different kinds of faith that we read about in the New Testament. He, he admitted that this was not original to him, but I don't think he gave credit to who it was. It might be like me. You read a lot of stuff, and you don't know where you got it. So, uh, but, I, but I think he does a really good job of kind of cataloging different components of faith that we run across in the New Testament uh, and kind of puts those into three big categories. And so the first category would be conversion faith. Uh, this, this is the faith that we, that we are most familiar with uh, because you know, we know that we come to salvation by faith in Christ. And so a lot of times when you're reading the New Testament and you're reading about faith, you're reading about conversion faith. Uh, that is that's clear in Ephesians 2.8 where Paul says, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Uh, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Uh, so uh, what I love about this verse is a reminder that even salvation, even the faith that is necessary for salvation, that too is a gift. Uh, it's, not, it's probably not the spiritual gift that Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians 12, but what a great reminder that even our salvation, and maybe even I should say especially our salvation, is not is not a reason for boasting in ourselves. Uh, we, we should never uh, 
allow ourselves to dwell with prideful thoughts about our salvation uh, because it's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. But, but many times when we read about faith in the New Testament, it is talking about saving faith, uh, conversion faith, the kind of the faith that we have to place in Christ in order to be saved. Um, now, different sermon for a different day, but I do like to just point out that faith in Christ is, is fuller than simply believing in Christ or believing that Jesus is who he says he is. Um, so we don't have time to really spell that out, but it is not enough just to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he lived a sinless life and died for our sins on the cross and rose again from the grave and is alive in heaven forevermore. Those are what I call the five historical facts of the gospel. And I think it's very evident, I think the New Testament makes it very clear, that you can believe those five facts of the gospel and not believe in Jesus in the way that John 3.16 calls for. Now, the most obvious way we know that is because I think the New Testament makes a very strong case that Satan himself believes all of the historical facts of the gospel. Uh, he, he would not argue with us that Jesus is the Son of God who lived a sinless life and died on the cross and rose from the dead and is alive in heaven forevermore. But is Satan going to go to heaven? No. Uh, it's amazing. Not a single person that I've ever given that test has, has hesitated. They've always known the answer to the last question. Even if they didn't know the answer to the first five questions with such confidence, they've always known the answer to the last question, which tells us that having knowledge of the facts and believing the facts is not enough. That when Jesus says that whosoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life, he obviously means more than whoever believes that I exist and did those things. He's talking about surrender. He's talking about trust. He's talking about taking that, that um, intellectual knowledge and making it um, a driving force for our action, uh, surrendering our lives to, G to Christ. Uh, that obviously is something Satan did not do. Uh, he was rebellious against Christ. And then, and then usually when I finish up that illustration, I like to remind us that we like to pick on Satan, but there are lots of people around us that are guilty of the very same thing, who believe in Jesus, believe in God. They would say they believe all that stuff, but they haven't surrendered their life to Jesus. Uh, and then bringing it closer to home, got a lot of those people in our churches, right? People who know the right stuff, but haven't ever surrendered their life to Jesus. They got to have saving faith. And uh, just, just one reminder for us, that's that's why it's so important that we continue to pray for people who are not saved. Because um, what does that third line say? What's that third line say? It is not your own doing. And it's not their own doing either. We, we, can't, just, we can't just badger someone to finally do the right thing and surrender to Jesus, can we? Because it's not their own doing. It is a gift of God. And so we do pray for the gift of faith, even in the conversion kind of faith. But, yes. If I could say something. Yes. I just want to say that I am so happy that you really push the fact that you have to have a heart change. Oh, absolutely. A lot of pastor's sermons, um, and so many of them just say, come to Jesus. But they don't, they don't say that you have to truly believe it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much evidence in the New Testament that there were many people who did come to Jesus. I mean, you think about John chapter 6, for example. Lots of people came to Jesus. That They came to see what he had to offer, and they wanted to experience the benefits, and then things got hard, and they were nowhere to be found because there was no transformation in their lives. And, you know, we, we, know, we know that there are those people all around us sitting in chairs beside us and in our Sunday school classes and sometimes standing in front of us in the mirror, right? If we're, if we're, if we're not careful, we can be the same way. Um, so we, that's, why, that's why we are told in the Scriptures, Paul says, to, to make your calling and election sure. Because it's not just about what you say with your mouth or believe with your mind. 
It's about how you surrender yourself with your heart and uh, you, you experience that transformation. Uh, so we see conversion faith. We also see continuing faith. Uh, I won't talk much about that because I think we've been talking about that for the last three weeks on Sunday morning uh, because that's what Hebrews 11 is really all about, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Sam Storms defines it this way, continuing faith is the faith we exercise daily as we look confidently to God to do in and through our lives all that he has promised to do. Uh, so we know that conversion faith is not the end, right? We have to, we have to allow that conversion faith to be continuing faith. Uh, that's the only thing I would say about these categories is that it's not three different kinds of faith. It's three different aspects of the same faith. And if our conversion faith is not continuing faith, guess what it's not? It's not conversion faith. That's the point that James makes. If the faith that you have in Christ that you say is your saving faith does not lead to anything, then it's dead faith. It is faith alone, and faith alone does not save. Uh, so we have to have that transforming faith that leads to uh, continuation in our lives. Like I said, that's what Hebrews 11 is all about. It's not about, it's not about Moses getting saved in every one of those paragraphs. It's not about Abraham getting saved in every one of those paragraphs. It's about them continuing to trust God and to follow through in life with what he's called them to because of uh, what he has promised to do. I think that's probably what you're looking at in uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, uh, which talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I believe that's kind of more the continuing faith aspect. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Uh, the Greek word is just the word faith, gentleness, and self-control. So we have conversion faith, continuing faith, and then charismatic faith, which I think is probably what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where he is talking about a particular gifting of faith for a particular time in your life or a particular need in the life of someone else around you. Uh, Sam Storms defines it this way, charismatic faith is the faith that appears to be spontaneous and functions as the divinely enabled condition on which the more overtly natural, excuse me, the more overtly supernatural acts of God depend. Uh, so the, the point is that the, the gift of faith seems to be uh, an, an a time in a believer's life in which God grants to them a supernatural measure of faith in order for him to do a supernatural work, either in their life or in the life of someone around them that they're praying for. And then uh, Sam Storms points to this connection between Matthew 21 and 1 Corinthians 13. And I think, and I've, I've even read Sam Storms' book before, but um, I, I never remember this connection until having reread it, but it makes this passage make so much more sense to me. And it makes, it makes two passages in the Scriptures, which I think are notoriously difficult, um, much easier to understand. Not necessarily easier to live out, but much easier to understand. Uh, so if you, if you look in Matthew chapter 21, uh, this is picking up right after Jesus has cursed the fig tree, uh, right outside on his way to Jerusalem, between Bethany and Jerusalem, and one day he curses the fig tree. They come back, and the disciples, they see it, and they're amazed because the fig tree has withered, and they're asking Jesus about that. And he says, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. All right, so if we just take this passage at face value, don't try to do any digging, and use it as a measure of our faith, I think I could easily say to you, how many of you have said to that mountain, be thrown into the sea, and have seen it thrown into the sea? Have any of you done that? So none of y'all have the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about? You unfaithful generation, okay? <laughs> Would you agree with me this is a notoriously difficult passage? I think that probably what Jesus is talking about here 
is he is talking about the gift of faith and the connection with prayer and the, the, what, what can happen when we see that. I, part of the reason I say that, if you go back to verse 21, if you have faith and do not doubt, I think it's so easy for us to use this passage as a sledgehammer to beat ourselves up and to beat everybody else up anytime there is a measure of doubt about anything in our life. And we can turn to a passage like this and say, you know, if, you're, if you have any doubt, your faith's not big enough, you're, you're not doing it right. The problem with that is it doesn't square with some stories we see in the New Testament. Do you all remember the story about John the Baptist having some doubt? He, when he was dying, he, he sent his disciples to Jesus' disciples, and they said, John wants to know, are you really the one? Is, are you really the Messiah? Now, did Jesus um, curse him and say, I cannot believe this guy still has doubts? How dare he not have faith? No, he said, there's no one greater born of women than John the Baptist. And yet he was, he was experienced intellectual doubt. Uh, so I, I don't think that, that any evidence of intellectual and spiritual doubt in our lives is, is evidence that we don't have good faith and, 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 and adequate faith in Christ. But I think he is pointing to some supernatural times in our lives in which we do have faith and don't doubt. Now, where does that come from? Does it come from us being so awesome? No, it is a gift of God that in some moments we can have such faith that we do not doubt. And in those moments, in those circumstances, we could say to the mountain, if that's what you have faith in, if that's the, if that's the object of the, the kind of faith I'm talking about, be taken up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. Um, and then he says in the next verse, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Okay, the reason that I connect this to the gift of faith that he mentions in verse 9, look at, look at this connection here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now remember, we've talked about it in the past. 1 Corinthians 13 is not just the love chapter. It's not just the chapter we're supposed to turn to when we don't know what to write on wifey's Valentine card. And so we just turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We can use it that way because we do need to love our wives we, we, we can apply it that way if we want to, but that's not the original context. Remember, 1 Corinthians 13 comes between what two chapters? 12 and 14, which are dealing with what? Spiritual gifts. So, so chapter 13, although it appears to be just the love chapter, Paul is teaching us about the use of our spiritual gifts. And notice what he says. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels... But have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Now, is there, a, is there a gift that deals with speaking in the tongue of men and, men and angels? Yeah, according to the Corinthians, there is. The, the gift of tongues. We'll get to that in a few weeks. But Paul says, if I, if I do that, if I exercise that gift, but don't have love, I'm a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, once again, another, another gift that he's just mentioned in chapter 12, that we'll get to maybe next week or the week after, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, does that sound familiar? That's what we talked about last week, right? The utterances of wisdom, the utterances of knowledge. He's talking about the gifts that he's just mentioned in chapter 12. And if I have all faith, what kind of faith? So as to remove mountains. Have you heard that phrase before? I think that's the connection that shows us that what Jesus was talking about is the same thing that Paul's talking about here, which is not just faith in general, but the gift of faith. This gift that God gives us in those moments. And Paul says, if you do any of these things without love, we are nothing. So D.A. Carson, um, kind of wrapping this up here, D.A. Carson says the gift of faith that we see in 1 Corinthians 12 is the God-given ability to believe what you do not really believe. Okay? And that's kind of a dangerous way to say it. His point is the ability to fully confidently believe what you would not normally fully confidently believe. That, that, is, that is God giving you the gift of faith in that particular moment to be able to trust God for a certain blessing that's not promised in Scripture. 
Now, why is that last part important? Why does he need to say a blessing not promised in Scripture? For the blessings that are promised in Scripture, do we need to have a supernatural measure of faith? No, because God is faithful. God is going to keep his promises. So if God tells us something in Scripture, we don't have to have supernatural faith to know it's going to come true because it's going to come true. It's God's written word. What we're talking about here is something that's not specifically revealed in Scripture, an answer to prayer that we can't look up and say, what does God want in this circumstance? Uh, an issue of healing that we can't look up and say, is this God's will? We, we know that it's not God's will to heal everybody. How do we know that? Because there's lots of evidence in the New Testament of people not being healed. Our own Lord Jesus died on the cross. Paul talks about the effect of suffering in our life and how God uses that suffering to grow us in our relationship with Christ. So we don't always know that God wants to heal everybody. Those, those are not blessings promised in his word, but sometimes God gives us the gift of faith to give us absolute confidence that those things are going to happen. Um, I believe that's also what James is talking about in James 5, 14, and 15, you see how these, these two gifts kind of, they kind of merge together between, uh, between faith and healing because they're so connected to each other. But in James 5, 14, and 15, is any one of you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Uh, that word save, the word translated save is the same word that's otherwise translated heal. So we don't know for sure whether he's talking about physical healing or spiritual healing or both. But it says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, will heal the one who is sick. Another, another bully verse a lot of times. Well, if you're, not, if you're not being healed, you just don't believe enough. You just don't have enough faith. Well, no, maybe, maybe you haven't been given the gift of faith for that particular illness in that particular season of your life. But the prayer of faith, the prayer that's prayed with the gift of faith, will save the one who is sick. Uh, notice it's the prayer of faith that, that, that does the saving. God is the one who does the healing, not the one who's offering the prayer. And that's some of what we'll talk about next week, that the gifts of healing do not necessarily refer to a person. They refer to the gift that God gives us to bring healing. Uh, so we need to understand this, uh, this conversion faith, this continuing faith, and, and this charismatic faith. And here's the good news. We'll, we'll stop here. The good news is um, there's pretty good evidence in the New Testament to give us the indication that the gifts we do not have, we can seek. We can ask for. Um, I started to think about this just, just this afternoon in, in wrapping up these slides um, in James chapter 1, um, let me turn there quickly. In James chapter 1, that, uh, a verse that we quote pretty often, at least I do. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. You know, I think it's very possible he's talking about general wisdom there, that if we want to grow in wisdom, we should ask God for that. But do, do we remember what what some of the gifts of the Spirit were that we studied last week. The utterance of wisdom, the ability to apply wisdom and share it with others is one of the gifts that God has given us. And it says if you lack wisdom, you can ask God. I think this is one of the many, many, many pieces of Scripture that give evidence to the fact that if we don't see giftedness in our life in a particular area, we can ask for it. We can pursue it. We can, we can tell God, you know, I, want, I want to be used in this way to be an encouragement to people around us. I, I, want, I want to see your Spirit's power in my life. So I, I don't think it's selfish or greedy to ask for giftedness, uh, to, to look at our giftedness in a way that is longing for our, us to be built up in that giftedness. And the reason it's not selfish is if we fully and rightly understand spiritual gifts, we will remember it's not about us, right? It's not about us having trophies. It's not about us earning points or badges. It's about the manifestation of the Spirit for what reason? For the common good. So if we are rightly asking and rightly desiring, God will know that we're not asking to feel better about ourselves, but to be used 
more for his kingdom to build up the body of Christ. You can ask for that. But to ask for it, you've got to start with salvation. You've got to start with surrendering your life to Christ and having a heart for service so that you can be used to build up the body of Christ. We will pick up there next week where we left off.